Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Fronteras, a changing America. I'm Anthony Moreno. Chili lovers now have an opportunity to enjoy a cookbook from experts at the Chili Pepper Institute at New Mexico State University. The official cookbook of the Chili Pepper Institute is out now, published by the University of New Mexico Press. Joining us on the program today are the book's authors, Dr. Paul Boslin, Professor Emeritus, and Dr. Wendy Hamilton. Professor Emerita from the College of Agriculture, Consumer and Environmental Sciences. Thank you both for joining us. Our pleasure. Let's start with inspiration for this book. Dr. Boslin. Sure, uh, every year the Chili Pepper Institute plants a teaching garden and we have more than 150 different types of chilies out there and we give tours and almost every time we do a tour somebody will say, how do I use this chili? How do I cook it? And so that was the inspiration. And so we went, we, the book's built kind of like a tour through the garden. As you go around the world and see the different chilies, we have recipes for those chilies. Dr. Hamilton, so it's kind of like you're taking a journey throughout the chili, is that correct? Yes, it is. And uh, as you walk through the garden and you think about uh, what could be done with that chili, or it's a flavor that you've never tried, or a heat level, then the cookbook guides you in the exact same way. And as the garden is a teaching laboratory about chili peppers, your kitchen is a teaching laboratory. I don't believe you make the same any dish twice exactly the same. So you get a chance to experiment with aroma, heat, flavor. One of the interesting things that I found with this book is you all also dive into the history of chili peppers. Uh, Dr. Boslin, can you give us an understanding of sure, that? Sure, it's, it's, it's it, chilies are an interesting crop. I say they're a vegetable, they're a spice, they're an ornamental, and they're a medicinal plant. Not many crops can do that many different things. And they're native to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it wasn't until Columbus's voyage, on his very first voyage, that he found chili peppers. But he thought they were the black pepper he was used to in Europe. So he took it back and said, I found pepper. And I also found Indian, so I made it around the world. Well, he was mistaken, but he introduced chili peppers to the rest of the world. And they became part of the cuisine very fast. Chilies are relative to tomatoes, and tomatoes, it took a long time before people would eat a tomato in Europe. They figured they were poisonous. But chilies almost instantaneously was incorporated into cuisines. Now, speaking of these cuisines, Dr. Hamilton, in this book, people can really explore all sorts of recipes for chili. Can you give us just a brief summary of what they can expect? Oh, uh, well, there are, as as Paul was saying, a variety of chili. There are a variety of recipes that are regional differentiations or from specific places around uh, particularly Central South America. And so we had to uh, make some real tough decisions about which recipes go in this cookbook because uh, there's only two per uh, varietal and we wanted to make sure that people got the flavor and, and a taste of what you can experience when you prepare the chili as if you were roasting it or freezing it and pulling it out or baking with it and so on. Well, you also offer some advice for folks handling chili before they uh, start cooking. What advice do you have? Uh, always wear uh, latex gloves of some kind and make sure that when you're tasting, you taste the wall of the chili pepper and not the placenta. And uh, you want to talk mm -hmm. about the seeds and, and what people think are hot and, and well, that, not hot. I'm glad you brought that up because heat is something that people enjoy at various levels, of course, right, right, or perhaps right, right. not at all. Right. Uh, Dr. Boslin, can you kind of dispel any misinformation around the heat? The really, at the Chili Pepper Institute, what we wanted to do is explain to people that 
flavors are just as important as chili heat. I always use the analogy of wine. First time you drink wine, alcohol is the only thing you really notice. Then you notice the difference between red and white wine. And the same thing with chilies. The first thing you notice is heat. But then you realize, oh, there's different tastes, different flavors. And that's why we show all the different types of chilies. And over the years, what I learned is, is every chili has what I call a heat profile, a characteristic heat. And what people should see is when they eat the chilies, how fast does the heat develop? Rapidly or delayed? How long does the chili heat linger? It's real short or a long time? Actually, half an hour, hours later, you still feel a burning sensation. The next trait is look where the heat develops. Tip of your tongue, your lips, a mid palate, the back of the throat. And then the, the other one that's very interesting is I call sharp or flat heat. Asian chilies have this sharp heat, which is like a prickly heat. It feels like little pins sticking you, where the flat heat, like New Mexico chilies, New Mexican type chilies, have like a paintbrush painted sit in. And then the fifth characteristic is always heat level. And, and, and companies will put mild, medium, or hot, but those have no standardization in the world of, of processing chilies. So you have to find out what brand you like, and do you like their mild, medium, or hot. We, on the research side, use what we call Scoville heat units, and that's a precise way to measure chili heat. Is there anything with the eye that we could notice as we're cutting into the chilies that may uh, make us immediately realize this may be a hot pepper? Excellent question. You cannot tell from the outside how hot a chili is going to be, but when you cut it open, look what's that placental or a vein in the middle where the seeds attach and you'll see a yellowing color in there. That's where the capsaicinoids are. The more yellow, the hotter the chili. Seeds don't have any heat, even though people say, oh, the seeds have the heat, but they're so close to those vesicles, we call them, those, those sacs, that when you cut them open, it gets a splash on the seeds. But really, those veins are the only way you can tell how hot it is. So if, so if somebody says, well, this is a really hot chili, you probably want to cut it open and look and see if it's at your level or not. In the book, you mentioned that there's over 3,000 varieties of chili. Correct. Around the world, we know there's actually more than that. We're up to about 5,000 now we know of. And that's because people, humans have selected. In the garden, we, the very first chili you see is called the chiltepin. It's the mother of all chilies. It's the wild little pea-shaped chili. That's what humans came in contact with when they first found chili peppers. And it always makes me wonder. A human goes up, bites it, and they get this pain, but they go back to it. You know, if I hit my thumb with a hammer, I learned not to hit my thumb with a hammer. But for some reason, and I think it's because it's that medicinal property, what happens when you eat chili peppers, you feel the heat and the heat dissipates. It's not because the chemical's gone away, your body's produced endorphins to block it. So it was probably the first pain reliever that humans had. Wow, and there's, there's different types of chili pods as well. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Um, we have different species. Five different species of chilies were domesticated when humans came in contact. That's how important it was that every time humans came in contact with chili peppers in the Western Hemisphere, they domesticated and made it into their chili. And then within chili species, we have to kind of differentiate. And so I came up with kind of this horticultural way of differentiating, we, and I call them pod types. And a bell pepper is a pod type, a jalapeno is a pod type, a uh, yellow wax is a pod type. And they're used differently in the way we cook with them. And so you don't, you always use, you don't use, say, a New Mexico green chili the same way you would use a jalapeno. Very interesting. And I, I really enjoyed in the book how you talked about connecting the recipes and the book to the teaching garden. How important was that to you both? It was extremely important and uh, we had for years tourists who would come through the teaching garden and then come back to the Chili Pepper Institute and ask, do you have a cookbook that will help me learn more about each one of the varietals that was out in the garden? And so that was the impetus for this cookbook is to be um, answering those questions that we gathered for years as uh, individuals walked through there and came back to the Institute. So we have tried to select recipes that might not be on their radar, but that they've heard about. 
and that they reflect or if they've traveled they know or have tasted some similar kind of food with that pepper in that region. People are very familiar. They're very familiar with some of these, the green chili sauce, a lot of us in our region, but there may be some folks watching who aren't as familiar or maybe curious about just how to start to make it. So maybe you could share a little bit about well, the recipe. Uh, you know, first of all, it's the uh, chili season in August in this area, and you go to the grocery store and the aroma of roasting chili is there. Mm -hmm. And so you take it home and you may have already had it roasted or you buy it fresh. Uh, you might want to make a, uh, a simple salsa and the salsa might be with a couple other uh, pico de gallo, a couple ingredients which is in here and um, chop it up fresh and uh, then have some chips and, and taste it and you can do it in a variety of different ways. Every place you go is a different flavor of red or green salsa. Let, let me jump in there, and this is a good way to see the jalapeno versus the New Mexico uh, flavor profile. If you make a, a, a sauce, you'll notice the jalapeno heats on the tip of your tongue or your lips, where the New Mexico is a mid-palate. And the jalapeno and the New Mexico both come on rapid and dissipate rapidly. So that you know if it's my tip of my tongues and my lips, oh, they've even put jalapenos in that dish. And back to the history of green okay, chili yes. here. And uh, you, as Dr. Uh, Wendy uh, Hamilton mentioned that created right here at New Mexico State University. Exactly, our very first horticulturist here at New Mexico State University was Fabian Garcia. He was hired to develop new crops for the, the farmers in New Mexico. And so he looked at a lot of horticultural crops. But one thing he noticed, there was no commercial crop of chili peppers. They were only being grown in backyard gardens. And so he's collected a bunch of varieties around, began intercrossing them and pollinizing and crossbreeding and coming up with a new pod type. And that new pod type he released and it was called New Mexico Number no. 9. And the farmers loved it and we actually began do processing it, canning it in that day and shipping it back east. And so the New Mexican pod type is what we call it. People sometimes call it Anaheim, but the great story there is we had a cowboy living here. He fell in love with that green chili. So he got to be the sheriff of Oxnard, California. So he goes out, but he plants some New Mexico green chili. And after a year or two, he says, I can make more money growing green chili than being the sheriff. So he quits being the sheriff, but he has to find a bigger farm. So he goes to Southern California, buys a bigger farm and starts growing it. But nobody's ever seen this chili because it came from New Mexico. And so they called it Anaheim because that's where his farm was. And the sheriff was Mr. Ortega. And that started the Ortega food line. So we had Old El Paso, California had Ortega. But today in the produce industry, Anaheim green chili is milder than New Mexican. So if they say, oh, this is New Mexican green chili, you expect it to be a little hotter, where Anaheim is milder. What is it about our climate in our region that really makes chili thrive here? Well, first off, our chilies don't like it here. We have made them, <laughs> we've adapted them. They like tropical rainforest. They like 68, 72 degrees every day with a gentle rain every so often. But we've selected them to grow here. And so, but it's kind of a stress environment. And when you grow crops under stress, they're more flavorful. It develops more flavor. If you grow the same chili in San Diego that you would grow here in Las Cruces, it'll have less heat and less flavor in San Diego. So we have more flavorful and a little hotter chili here. Wow, and it looks like flavor is just all over the place with these recipes that you have. Um, I, I would like to hear a little bit about some of the salsas that folks can enjoy. Well, um, the, the kinds of salsas that are in here are specific to areas. So um, you want to, first of all, when you're making these salsa recipes, you try the chili variety that is listed in here and then you can experiment with additional other chilies, but you also want to experiment with the amount of chili pepper that you do put in the salsa, because that's where the consumer is very familiar with the mild, medium, and hot. 
and you want to make sure that you don't blow your guests out of the <laughs> dining room or the kitchen, and you want to make sure that uh, you start with less rather than more. What about for those folks who love the heat? Uh, again, you still want to experiment because mm -hmm. some of these peppers, uh, not only is there variation in how they're grown and the amount of stress that's put on them by the climate, but uh, the variation in the heat level could change. You could have two jalapenos and they could be at different heat levels. The flavor is more standard, but the heat level can vary quite a bit, so you must experiment. And one of the things you should think about is that make it for the person that wants the mildest. Even one household, there's someone that likes it really hot usually, someone likes it milder. So think about that. You can always make it hotter, but it's kind of hard to make it milder. So you can always add something to make it a little hotter. Green chili has been infused in so many different types of foods in our region. I'm wondering from both of you, was there something that you've seen in recent years that you were like, that's the first time I've ever seen green chili in that? Uh, Any surprises? Not for me. Well, two <laughs> is, one is apple pie. They tell oh, me if you put yeah. it in apple pie, it, it brings out more of an apple flavor. Don't know mm. it's true, I haven't done it. And the other one is ice cream, green chili and ice cream. And I said, you know, that's like putting green chili in beer. You, you ruined two things there. And I think you ruined two things with putting it in ice cream too, but. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of ice cream, there are some interesting desserts in this book. Can you share a little bit about uh, what people can uh, discover? Well, the number one dessert in the book, and you have to flip all the way almost to the end, is the boot jalokia brownie. And that's what actually Dr. Boslin uh, made famous and is he is known for that boot jalokia brownie. And so we put the recipe in here as a treat for everyone who wanted to make that on their own. And we did an, actu we did an experiment with students in the college uh, during the period of time that we were experimenting with the amount of boot jalokia powder that we put in the recipe. So we had uh, an eighth of a tablespoon of boot powder um, a, a quarter, a third, and a half. And we made those recipe, we made the brownies with those different amounts of boot jalokia, and then they rated them. And we did that over a series of days to see if there was any variation, any preference. And so this is truly, uh, it was a research project uh, done and completed by students uh, to, to develop the uh, what we thought or what we think is the, the um, best quantity of boot jalokia powder to put in the brownies. But uh, for some, it is still very hot. It was interesting, we opened it to the public to come and, and so people would call, they'd get in the parking lot, call the institute, and we'd run down to the, their car with a plate of three little brownies and go, which one do you like, A, B, or C? Write it down, go back up to the, the lab. Okay, write that, record it down. And so, and around here, I think we have calichis with their wonderful vanilla um, uh, gelato, is it? I, I don't know what you, but they're, they're, they're custard. Mm -hmm. They're vanilla custard. So the uh, vanilla custard on those brownies is the best dessert in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that sounds amazing. Uh, I, I also found it interesting that you have some soups in here as well. Oh, yes. Um, uh, soup is one of my favorite kinds of uh, foods, particularly around a lunchtime. And so uh, we tried to find, again, recipes. Of course, the uh, tortilla soup is, is in there, but we have uh, three or four other ones that um, are local, more localized to regional or to levels to very um, specific places uh, in both Central and South America. You also have the something interesting I found, the Turkish kebabs. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never had green chili with Turkish kebabs. Can you tell me about that? Um, well, again, it's a, a variation on uh, a kebab recipe and the pepper uh, infuses a little bit of its flavor into the meat and the other vegetables. So uh, you wanna try and stuff those, or push those kebabs very closely together so that the flavor is infused through, across. And then you can also use an infusion oil that is made with an oil or even a honey. 
you can infuse with chili peppers to uh, get that additional kick or benefit. One of the interesting soups we have in there in the Philippines, they make a chicken soup. And what they use is the leaves of the chili pepper, kind of like spinach, they put that in there. Because chili pepper leaves are, are not, not toxic. You can actually eat them. So they put chili pepper leaves, and actually it comes from the species that makes Tabasco. And so they use capsicum frutescent leaves in their chicken noodle soup, not chicken noodle, but chicken soup. Mm -hmm. I did mm -hmm. notice some some noodles uh, <laughs> that you have noodle recipes that you yes. have. They're very popular, yes. uh, and and that's uh, associated with some Asian pepper mm -hmm. types as well. Uh, yeah. Very interesting uh, recipes that you have here. Is there one that you think is just going to amaze folks? Besides, you know, mm. the whole book, but is there one in particular <laughs> that might be one of your favorites? Wow, um, I think that. Um, for, for me, it would be, um, I like the jerk burger. I just love that. Um, and that's, of course, um, a wild spin-off from our green chili uh, cheeseburgers that, that we have here. But what um, I think everyone will have a different recipe that they favor, they enjoy. Some of them are a bit um, uh, complicated in terms of the number of ingredients, but the number of ingredients are specific to how to enhance that heat and that flavor that, and the aroma that comes out of it. Very interesting. We also have a lot of traditional foods here that, from fo that folks in our region enjoy. Can you share a little bit about that? Like the chili relleno. Everyone, everyone <laughs> wants a relleno recipe and there's suave fish tacos and, um, uh, then, of course, the salsas, the appetizers, the calabacitas, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have uh, a fudge a fudge topping for our vanilla ice cream as well. Really, so, really yeah. amazing, the story that you all tell here. Uh, Dr. Boslin, I'd like to hear from you. Um, you know, it's the time of the year where we see roasters out there and everybody's getting excited about green chili. Um, can you share a little bit about how this year in particular has been mm -hmm. on the chili harvest with the amount of high temperatures we've experienced in this region? Sure, this has been a very interesting growing season because in June we had kind of cool weather. Chilies were a little, growing a little slow, but it was, um, they set fruit. And chilies cannot set fruit when the temperature gets above 95 or below 55 at night. So there's a range. So June was fine, they set fruit, but then we started getting the triple digits and the chili will just drop flowers. They can't set. And tomatoes are the same way. And so it's, it's gonna be what we call a split set. As Soon as it cools off and they can set again, we'll get the top. But the chilies are gonna be a little hotter this year. So, you know, we say, you know, like, uh, realize that if you get the mild, it might be what you would call medium. And so they're gonna be a little warmer. And then also we get on the green chilies, unfortunately, what we call blossom end rot, just like tomatoes. And those can't be harvested, so the yields will be down. We're hoping that the later um, crop, the one that was planted a little later, is gonna mature in September, maybe a little into October, will help the growers get the yields they need. So it's been a tough year. And unfortunately, even if you gave the chili more water, it doesn't help through this stress. It actually brings in disease. So then it's a double whammy for the poor growers. So it's, it's chili is not a crop for the faint at heart. You have to be a real uh, person to want to grow chili, I would say. Talking with growers and, and folks in the industry, uh, what are some of their major concerns right now with Chile and New Mexico? Well, for us mainly, it's the offshore production. We have so much competition from around the world, and so our growers are competing again in a world market, and so that's one of their biggest concerns. And next is water. Water is limited here. Uh, we haven't got the monsoonal rains this year to fill up the reservoir, so they're gonna have to pump. Pumping water costs more than using the river water, so they have an added cost. So we have, and, and, and if this you know, climate change continues, that we have this hot weather, we'll have less yield, then we have less water. So it's, it's a big issue that, that, and actually we're trying to breed for you know, chilies that'll set in higher uh, temperatures and use less water, water efficiency. We call it uh, water efficiency because we don't really want drought tolerant. The wild chiltopene's drought tolerant, but what it does, it goes dormant. It drops all its leaves, it sits dormant until the rains come, and then it grows. But a farmer has to have that chili growing. And so what we say is, given an equal amount of water, does it yield more chili? 
New Mexico has been putting an effort into branding chili uh, that is from our, our state. How do you think this book can really make an impact with that, Dr. Hamilton? Well, um, because it is the land of enchantment and um, Chile is uh, very well associated with New Mexico, we do have some um, name recognition and that's wonderful. We have actually the label of Hatch Green Chili, although there is not a variety of Hatch Green Chili, but the fact that it is labeled as Hatch and it's sold all over the United States and beyond provides the opportunity supposedly for New Mexico growers to get a share of the income. Uh, but sometimes even that is a problem. It's, um, we need to um, keep promoting, and this is just another way to promote the flavor and enhancement. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I oh. do want to thank you all for joining us. The book is the official cookbook of the Chili Pepper Institute. It is out now. Dr. Boslin, Dr. Hamilton, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Our pleasure. And we want to thank you for joining us for this episode. Remember, you can always stay updated at our website, krwg.org. I'm Anthony Moreno. We'll see you next time.